Welcome to the last day of measuring the immeasurable. Today we want to talk about fractals. So let's just take a look at the chaos game we've just played. We started out with a triangle, and you could have picked a dot anywhere in that triangle. But after the first round of the game, that first dot ends up in one of these spaces. After the second round, it ended up in one of these spaces. And then these spaces. And then these spaces. And on and on and on. The resulting shape is a bizarre thing, something that we're not used to seeing. One of its kind of cool properties is the fact that it's similar to itself. Can you see it? Well, there's one part who looks exactly like the whole thing. So the entire triangle is just a scaled up version of this little piece. Or is it a scaled up version of this little piece? Or this little piece? In fact, we can keep zooming in and find that every part of this triangle is similar to a smaller and smaller and smaller part of it. Objects like these are called fractals. The most famous fractal of is this one, the Mendelbrot set, which you might have seen on posters right here. And it has the property that as you zoom in to each one of these circles, you keep finding the same shirt circle, surrounded by the same circles, surrounded by the same circles, surrounded by the same circles. So these two sets are examples of sets that are similar to themselves, and so we want to investigate these guys today. So the key definition we're going to need is what it means to be self-similar. We see that a figure is self-similar if it's similar to a smaller portion of itself. For example, every line segment is self-similar. Every line segment just looks like a scaled-up version of a smaller line segment. In this case, I've scaled it up by a factor of 2. Squares are also self-similar. The whole square looks like, say, any chunk taken out of a corner. If I pull this piece out, then I see that the big square is just a scaled-up version of the small square by a factor of 2. Not everything is self-similar. If I didn't have the solid interior, and I just had the square's boundary, this wouldn't be self-similar. Because if you look at some small portion of it, say its corner, well then the corner looks like an L, not a square. So how would you get a self-similar shape? Well, one way to build a self-similar shape is through iteration, repeating a simple step over and over and over again, which will yield surprising results. To make self-similar shapes, we need two ingredients, an initiator, which is some kind of a starting shape, and then a generator, which is a collection of shapes that includes two or more scaled-down copies of the initiator. And then you're going to have a rule, and the rule is simply Replace each copy of the initiator by the scaled down generator and repeat. So what does that mean? Let's try an example. Suppose I give you a black triangle as your initiator, as your starting shape. And then as your generator, I give you the same triangle with the middle third cut out. This is the generator. Notice that the generator is built out of three triangles who look just like the initiator. So I could replace each one of those three little triangles by a scaled down version of the generator. Now I've got a grand total of nine little triangles who look just like scaled down versions of the initiator. So I replace them with the generator. And then I repeat again and again and again. And we recover this triangle, which is known to mathematicians as Sierpinski's triangle. Turns out that Sierpinski has other shapes too. He's got a square. Here's the initiator for the square, and here's the generator. You see what happened? We chopped the square up into nine pieces and took the middle part out. Now look at it. There's eight little small squares around the center, so we can repeat. We can stick the generator in each one of those. Now around each one of those small squares are eight smaller squares. And then again. Another famous example is the Cook Snowflake Curve, which is a self-similar figure formed by building up a line rather than breaking down a solid polygon. Its initiator is a straight line, and its generator is the following zigzag line. It goes over, up, down, across. So since this generator has four copies of the initiator, four copies of the original line, we'll replace each one of those four copies with the zigzaggy shape. But now I've got a grand total of 16 little copies of the initiator, so I'll stick 16 more copies of the, or the generator. And again, if I keep repeating this, I get the Cook 
snowflake curve. Now, can you see the similarity? Do you see small parts of it in the whole? Well, here are four small subdivisions who look like the entire thing. We are getting self-similar figures. Now, it seems like we're, I've been going out of my way to make elaborate and weird examples of self-similar figures, but believe it or not, it's all around you. It's in the shells of nautiluses. It's in the folds of plants, or in mountain ranges and rivers. At each step of the way, the whole shape can be seen to be similar to some small part of it. In the case of the mountain range, the entire mountain range is reflected right here, or right here. Some shapes can be similar on several levels. For example, the final picture shows rivers cutting through the desert, but the shape of the main artery of the river is repeated here, and here, and here. The two shapes on the bottoms are the ones that we want to focus on, because they exhibit similarity in multiple locations. And that's the heart of an idea called a fractal. A fractal is a type of geometric object that displays self-similarity over several locations and over several scales. So you'll find fractals everywhere around you. You also find fractals in architecture. This is a style of Indian temple where each tower is built on smaller and smaller towers. It's got a new popularity in computer-generated art, but it's also sort of the heart and soul of computer-generated animation. And since the 90s, fractals have even found an unexpected use in telephone and communications antennas. Now, one of the cool properties about a fractal, in addition to just its sort of overwhelmingly strange shape, is that fractals are not one-dimensional or two-dimensional objects, but they live somewhere in between. To see why that's the case, let's take a look at scaling and dimension. We've seen that scaling is always connected to the dimension of the object. If you took a line which is one-dimensional, it's one dimension being length, and then scale it by a factor of one, two, or three, like I've shown here. But whenever you scale a line, really you can break it down into similar copies. A line that's scaled by a factor of two is just made out of two of the original lines, and a line scaled by a factor of three is made of three of them. When we get to a square, a square is two-dimensional. It has length and width. What happens when we take a square and we scale it up by a factor of two? The area goes up by a factor of four, which means I can build the scaled up square out of four copies of the original. If I scale the square up even bigger, make it three times as big, we know from previous lectures that the area goes up by a factor of three squared or nine. So that tells me that my big square can be built out of nine copies of the original. So what we've seen again is that if we scale up a square by s, then we get s squared copies of the square. What about a cube? It's a three-dimensional object with length and width and height. What happens when we scale it up, say by a factor of two? Well, then we get a grand total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pieces. If we scale it up by a factor of three, we're going to get 27 pieces. So we see that when we scale up a cube by s, then we get s cubed copies of that. So a one-dimensional object scaled by s gets s copies. A two-dimensional object scaled by s gets s squared copies. And a three-dimensional object scaled by s gets s cubed copies. So what about our Suprinsky triangle? Suppose you take this triangle and you scale it up by a factor of two. How many copies of the original triangle do you get? Well, you get three of them. So when we scaled it up by two, we got three copies. Not two to the first power, not two to the second power, not two to the third power. In fact, since two to the first power is two, but two squared is four, and we got three, it has to be some dimension between one and two. But what exactly is it? Well, it turns out that this was investigated in 1945 by a mathematician named P.A.P. P. Moran, who noticed the following thing about shapes that could be broken up and built out of similar copies of themselves. If you took a line, and you built a line out of smaller copies of itself, so you built out a line out of two segments of scaled down by a half, or three segments scaled down by a third, or a segment scaled down by a half and a third and a sixth together. If you took the scaling factors and added them up, you always got one. Now, when it came to two dimensions, that didn't work. Let's take a look at a couple of different ways to build a big square out of similar copies of a square. So let me put the scaling factors on. 
Now notice what happened for lines didn't, doesn't work here. I can't go and take the scaling factor a half plus a half plus a half plus a half and get one. I'd get two. Or if I took a third plus 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 a third, I'd get three, not one. But Moran noticed this. If you took the scaling factors a half, a half, a half, a half, squared them and add them up, you got one. And if you took the scaling factors a third, a third, a third, a third, a third, nine times, squared them, add them up, you get one. And if you even took this last example, two thirds squared plus a third squared plus a third squared plus a third squared plus a third squared plus a six squared plus a six squared plus a six squared plus a six squared, still totals up to one. What about three dimensions? If you took a big giant block and we break it down into eight pieces of equal size, each scaled down by a factor of two. Well, if I take a half and add it eight times, I don't get one. If I take a half squared and add it eight times, I don't get one. But if I take a half cubed and I add it eight times, I'll get one. Or if I take one piece and break it down into 27 equal similar copies of each scaled down by a factor of a third, I'd find that a third plus cube plus a third cube plus a third cubed 27 times would get me one. So Moran came up with the following equation. Suppose that a figure could be decomposed entirely into smaller copies of itself. Copy one, copy two, copy three. Suppose that copy one is scaled down by a factor of S1, copy two is scaled down by S2, copy three by S3, and so on. Then there is only one value of D who satisfies the equation. One is equal to the first scaling factor to the D, plus the second scaling factor to the D, plus the third scaling factor to the D, all the way down for the number of pieces. This value D is called the dimension of the figure. So we've seen that squares are two-dimensional and cubes are three-dimensional. But what about the Sierpinski triangle? It can be decomposed into three similar pieces. What's the scaling factor for each one? Well, if I measure the triangle, the big triangle is six centimeters long, the small one three centimeters long, so the scaling factor is a half. So let's write the Moran equation. One is equal to a half to the D, plus a half to the D, plus a half to the D. The scaling factors of each piece to the Dth power. That simplifies to one equals three times one half to the D. Now that's a little bit tricky to solve algebraically. You'd need to know something about logarithms. But I'm not going to be that clever. I'm just going to make guesses. Let me guess values between 1 and 2, because I knew it was supposed to be between there. So in, for example, d is equal to 1, then 3 times 1 half to the d is 1.5. If d is equal to 1.3, then 3 times 1 half d is equal to 1.22. So if I look at this table, then I see that 1.6 gets me the closest a value of 0 0.99. So somewhere between 1.5 and 1.6 is the value we're looking for. And with a little bit more trial and error, you can find that d equals 1.58 will work. So the Sierpinski triangle has a dimension of 1.58. It's neither one-dimensional nor two-dimensional. It's bigger than a line, but smaller than a square. By the way, the fact that it has a fractional dimension is where the word fractal came from. What about Sierpinski's square? Well, first we have to break it down into similar pieces. In this case, I can break the big square into eight copies of the big square. Each one of these copies is one-third the size of the original shape, so there's a scaling factor of a third. So the Sierpinski formula would be one is equal to a third to the d plus a third to the d plus a third to the d eight times, or one is equal to eight times a third to the d. So let's attack this like we did before by making a table of values. So if we try d going from 1, 1.1, 1 .1, 1 1.2, all the way up to 2, let's look for the value who makes 8 times 1 third of the d as close to 1 as possible. And apparently it happens on my table, the closest value it happens at is at 1.9. But it's somewhere between 1.8 and 1.9. And with a little bit more trial and error, we can come up with 1.89. So Sierpinski square is 1.89 dimensional. It's just a smidge less than a two-dimensional object. Let's try a new fractal that we haven't seen before, the S fractal. What's its dimension? Well, the first thing we have to do is break it down into pieces who are similar to the whole thing. In this case, we could break it down into three similar pieces, although they're going to be at different scales. Can you see three separate pieces that would describe the whole shape? How about these ones? So now that I've identified my three pieces, I need to figure out what the different scaling factors are. 
Now the whole shape from tip to tip is 11 centimeters across. The little s is just 2 centimeters across, while the middle s is 9.5 centimeters across. So now that I know what the measurements are, I can find the scaling factors. So the Moran equation would say that 1 is equal to the scaling factor for the little shape, 2 divided by 11, plus the scaling factor for the other little shape, 2 divided by 11 to the d, plus the scaling factor for the middle shape, 9.5 over 11 to the d. If we set up yet another table of values of d going between 1 and 2, we find that we get 1.00 when d is equal to 1.4. And so the s fractal is 1.4 dimensional. So now it's your turn. Split up into two-person teams and work on the computing fractal dimensions worksheet and have fun creating fractals.